Let me say good morning to you again. It is about 1040 in the a.m. June the 26th, 2022. Uh, it's been a very short intermission from the end of our Sunday school to the beginning of our morning worship, which is where we are now. But I take all of that blame onto myself for going a bit longer in our uh, morning Sunday school lesson. However, I still feel comfortable in knowing, hey, we did go over and go through what God's Word said. So for those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. I'm the pastor of New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be for over 14 years now. And I'm certainly thankful for God keeping the union of pastor and people. And people sometimes, from time to time, they ask me, you know, how's things going? I said, man, it's going good. They're, they're almost shocked. It's as if they're wanting to hear some horror story, some sad story, some, you know, tumultuous, malicious situation, but there is none. I mean, we have our ups and downs like any other congregation, but God has been blessing us and keeping us and sustaining us, and I'm certainly thankful for that. If you don't mind when you come on, just to, when you log on, just to say good morning and hey, and greet everyone as we get started. We have about two and a half, three minutes left before we get started here at 1045. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time by starting on time so that, you know, when we say we're going to start at a particular time, that we actually start at that particular time. So to Reverend and Sister Austin, good morning to you. Looks like Sister Milam is with us. Good morning to you, to the Milam family. Uh, Brother Tidwell, good morning to you again. <laughs> Glad to have all of you with us this morning. Uh, we're going to be in two separate passages this morning. To our youth director, God bless you, Sister Ashley Brown. We're going to be in two separate passages. Uh, first Peter and then second Peter. And let me pause right now. Sister Brown, I was at St. Francis' house. And one of your clients told me, she said, your face look familiar. And I didn't know how to take that. I was like, oh, uh, okay. I said, okay. She said, do you preach? I was like, yeah, yeah. She said, that's where I know you from because Ashley Brown does my hair and on Wednesday she had Bible study on and I saw your face before. I was like, okay, all right. So one of your clients, you're helping them out by, well, I guess helping them out. Hopefully it was a good Bible study lesson, but she, uh, I thought that was ironic and funny at the same time. She just said, your face look familiar. But uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, we'll go ahead and get started here in just a moment. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're also going to be in 2 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 5, and we will also be in 2 Peter chapter 2. So, good morning to everyone. Looks like the Bird family is with us. God bless you this morning. 1 Peter 5 and 2 Peter 2. And I'm going to try my best to combine these two passages to help us know or to grow and to understand in our expectations for a pastor. And what I am going to read to you it's not going to be my opinion, not going to be, you know, my thoughts. It's going to be what the word says. I, I think you just can't go wrong with staying with the book. So we have about a minute or so left. We're going to start prayer at 1045. Good morning to all of you. So let's turn to 1 Peter. Get your bookmark. 1 Peter chapter 5. And then we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 2. So hopefully everyone got your Bible ready and you'll be able to follow along with us. So if you don't mind, let's, let's pause what we're doing. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go further. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for another day, another blessing, another privilege to come and to learn, to preach and to teach. Help us to find understanding. Help us to know what your word says, what it says directly. And help us, Lord, by your strength 
to live out with what your word says. It is so difficult, Father, trying to live godly in an ungodly world. We're bombarded on every side with so many things and thoughts and mindsets that are, that are designed to pull us away from you. We become desensitized to what is wrong. And when what is right has been presented to us, it makes it seem strange in some cases. But we pray for the insight that you can give. We pray for grace when we step out of line. And we just ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, to help us to become more like you. Let that process be initiated or even further advanced through the preaching and teaching this morning. All the credit goes to you. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen, amen, and amen. First Peter, I'm going to read this one first. Chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. So follow along with me. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being, it says in the King James Version, in samples, but it means being an example to the flock. And if you've done this, verse 4, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away, that does not fade away. Flip over one book, 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. 2 Peter 2, 1, 2, and 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, false teachings, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, not a few, shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not, meaning they're not going to get away. It may seem like a long time. Judgment may seem a long way away. Peter is saying they won't get away with it. First Peter chapter 5, 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, there's another passage I want to bring to your attention. You don't have to turn here, certainly, but it's in Philippians chapter 3. Our Bible study has been coming from the book of Philippians. But in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord. And he says, To write the same things to you. To me, it's not bad, it's not grievous, but to you, it's safe. That phrase, the same thing. I want to give all of you some insight into preaching, into pastoring, because sometimes people can accuse you of something negative or nefarious when they say, well, he, he went over this scripture two years ago. Look, I wrote it in my Bible. That's the same text, the same, maybe a different title, the same thing. When you go over a text that you have gone over before, 
it's not necessarily meaning that you haven't studied, you're not prepared, so you pull something from the back of the closet that you've gone over before. No, no, no. What it does show, and I can't say every case, what it does show is that you are consistent in preaching. You're consistent, meaning what you preach then is still true now. The truth don't change. You are consistent. Uh, Philippians 3 verse 1 is what I read, Sister Tim's. So when it talks about the same things, you're consistent in preaching. Also, sometimes you have to reiterate certain texts to stress the importance of what is being read and what we're teaching. So when it comes to 2 Peter 2, when it comes to 1 Peter 5, have I gone over these verses and many verses in our Sunday school lesson before? Of course I have. But some people are not aware and do not understand that it's in their mind, if you preach a text once, you can never go back to it again. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. There may be things going on in the life of the church that need this text. There may be things going on personally to where you need this text. It just may be sovereignly the way God works with his preacher, with his servant, that some kind of way God sovereignly has led you back to familiar ground again. So I want us to look at, first of all, 1 Peter chapter 5. And I thank the Lord for 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Because what do we know about Peter at the end of the Gospels? He denied Jesus. He ran off in the morning and he wept. And we find him in the last chapter of John. He said, I'm going fishing. In John chapter 21. In John 21, we see when Peter, Peter, who has gone fishing. This wasn't Peter passing time. This wasn't Peter just, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit bored. Let me fill my time by throwing my net in the water. I'm a fisherman. That was effectively Peter who quit preaching. He quit the ministry. He walked away from serving the Lord. And what happened while he was finished uh, fishing? Jesus showed up. And when Jesus showed up, he called Peter back into the preaching ministry. We remember the three calls. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. That was Peter being called back into the preaching ministry. So as we get to 1 Peter and 2 Peter, it's been about a couple of decades. We don't know what he's been doing, where he's been at, but we can fill in the gaps by saying one thing we know he's been doing, he's been pastoring God's people. And when we get to 1 Peter chapter 5, a book that is designed to help Christians in suffering, in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter gives these beautiful words. 1 Peter 5 and 1. I'm writing to the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and I'm a witness of what Jesus went through, and I'm also going to be a partaker in the glory that shall be revealed. So what, the, the, the part of this verse I want to emphasize is when Peter says, I'm exhorting and encouraging the elders that are among you. And guess what? I'm also a fellow elder. The word elder is synonymous with the word pastor, the word bishop. Uh, uh, overseer all these words describe the same office listen to me many beliefs have taken the word elder or bishop or overseer and kind of made them like a super preacher a preacher above preacher a preacher who tells other pastors and preachers what to do according to the scripture there is no distinction you can say bishop, you can say pastor, you can say shepherd, you can say 
elder. You can say overseer. According to scripture, they're all the same office. According to our culture, they've taken different places. But according to the Bible, all of these things are the same. If somebody called me Bishop Smith, that's not traditionally how we refer to a pastor in the Baptist faith. But I understand biblically it would be the same thing. To the ears of many, it may seem different because no one calls me that. But according to scripture, all of these things are the same. And Peter emphasizes this, who says, I'm exhorting you and I'm also an elder. He says it this way, I'm a fellow elder. You see, the Catholic faith says that Peter is the first pope. And Peter is the first pope preacher above all these other preachers. If he was, Peter didn't know it. Peter didn't see himself as a preacher above preachers, a pastor above pastors, an elder above elders. He said, I'm an elder among of the elders. Don't jack me up above somebody else. I'm writing to the elders which are among you, and I'm always a, I'm a fellow elder, and I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and I am a, uh, I'll be a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed the flock of God. He uses the term of shepherding. And he says the elder, the pastor, the overseer, the bishop of a church, your job is not to feed on the flock. Your job is to feed the flock, to shepherd the flock, to lead the flock flock, to provide for the flock, not to take away from the flock. We'll get more into that when we get to 2 Peter, but here Peter is saying, listen, job number one, shepherd them, feed them, give them insight from the word of God. Be a shepherd that actually protects, cares for, guides, loves the flock of God. It says, feed the flock of God. Pay attention. They're not your flock. They're not your people. They're not your members. Those are not your musicians. They're not your choir. Those are not your preachers. Those are not your deacons, et cetera, et cetera. The line goes on. All of them are the flock of God. They belong to him. I don't think it's necessarily sinful when I hear preachers and pastors say, yeah, I'm going to send my preacher, I, 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 yeah, my choir, and, and my members. And I, I don't think it's necessarily sinful Personally, I choose not to use that phrase as a constant reminder to me of who people really belong to. I didn't die on, cross, on the cross late one Friday and rose early Sunday morning. I didn't shed my blood on Calvary's Hill. I did not do that. Jesus did that. And the church, which includes myself, the flock, which includes myself, we all belong to him. Peter recognized this fact when he said, feed them, feed the flock of God, which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof. The word oversight speaks to the authority of a pastor. It speaks to godly authority. Let me speak to you now about the meat of the matter. Listen to me. A pastor's, myself, a pastor's authority begins and ends with the four corners of the Bible. If the Bible doesn't speak on it, he's got no authority over it. Listen to me now. The authority that a pastor has 
is delegated authority, meaning authority that God has said he's supposed to have. It's like when my mother would leave and I would stay home with my younger sisters, she would say, now y'all listen to your brother because he's the oldest. And then she would give me examples or excuse me, uh, she would give me my uh, uh, rules of what I need to do. Make sure you do this, do that, do this, do that. Y'all listen to your brother and listen, listen to him till I come back. Because when mama come home, mama the real authority. She just put me in a position of authority over my younger sisters. It was because I was older, of course. But when God puts a pastor in authority, not because he knows more about the Bible per se. He should know the word. He should be apt and able to teach skillfully. But listen, God has given to him delegated authority. God says, I want this person to be the head of the flock. I want this man to be the leader of this congregation. And here Peter says, taking the oversight thereof. It's a way of referencing that every member of the flock, every ministry of the church, it falls under the pastor's umbrella of authority. In the sense of, stay with me now, God will hold him accountable if it goes off track. Meaning, if you didn't set the right example, if you didn't preach and teach my word, if you didn't lovingly discipline, if you didn't lovingly encourage, if you did not point them in the right direction, everyone has to make their own decision. But if you actively went against what you know was right just to appease the masses or because you were afraid to tell what is true, if you led them the wrong way, I'm going to see about that. You will not get away. We'll look at 2 Peter in a moment to go further onto the, into that. He says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. But then he starts by saying, here's how you shouldn't do it. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre for money, but of a ready mind. And make sure, verse 3, that you don't walk around acting like a God, a Lord, or you're better than God's people. But what you should do is to be an example to the flock. Now, I want you to notice the construction of this verse. Verse 2 and verse 3. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. That's a positive. That's a narrative. That's what you should do. Take the oversight. You're a leader of them. And the rest of verse 2, even beginning of verse 3, tells you how you shouldn't do it. He puts more attention to not doing it the wrong way than he puts attention into what you should be doing the right way. Meaning a leader is not to lead by constraint. Meaning you don't want to do it. You feel like you got to do it. Remember this morning in Sunday school when we talked about worshiping the Lord and praising God and being used in his service. Serving God is not something that you got to do, like taking bad medicine to feel good. Serving God is something that you get to do. It's an opportunity. So when he says when you are a leader, you shouldn't feel like I sure don't want to do that. I don't feel like it. No, you should be willing. You should be ready. You should do it willingly. And then I cannot underestimate or underemphasize the next portion of verse 2. When you lead God's people, it is not to be done for money. Whew. Lord have mercy. How many churches, y'all stay with me now, have been torn apart because the shepherd the pastor, the bishop, the overseer, he has shown himself to be greedy, materialistic, avarice. Uh, it's all about what he can gain and not what he can give. How many churches have had those awful church meetings? 
and the pastor comes all out and you know the church doesn't have but ten dollars in the account and you're asking the church to buy you a car for fifty dollars and it don't matter that the church ain't got it god to make a way and god told me to tell you and what it boils down to when you're just honest if you just use just practical common sense oh he just wants some money he, just, he, 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 he could care less about if the lights are on. He could care less about if ministries going. He sure ain't talking about sending money to support Easter Seals or United Way or giving food to the hungry. He ain't, no, no, no. He want to give food to his belly. He said, Peter says, when we lead, we are not to do it because we feel compelled or we pushed into it. We should not do it willingly. And when we lead, Financial material gain is not a part of our thinking. That should not be a part of your thinking. Can God use your gift to make room for you in tangible ways? Well, of course. Yes. I, I, I don't know a preacher alive. I don't know a preacher worth his salt that wouldn't want to wake up at 730 be at the church by 8, have office hours, develop your sermon in there, take a lunch break, go visit the sick, have meetings with different people on different things, come back to the office and study, get ready for Bible study and pray, check on this member and stay there till 5 and go. I don't know a preacher worth his salt that wouldn't want to do that as his daily occupation. I, listen, it's difficult working from 8 to 5 and coming home and cutting grass and then got to carve out time to study and carve out time to relax and carve out time. It's difficult because of other, you know, different reasons. But when it comes to pastoring a church, Peter said, listen, provide for them. And your goal is not to do it for filthy lucre, for money. No, do it of a ready mind. And he reemphasizes something in verse 3. Don't act like you are a Lord, and it says over God's heritage, over God's people. Listen, remember, you're only in authority because I gave you that authority. Remember, you're only to do and to say what I told you to do and to say. Remember, those are not your people. And don't you walk around lording yourself over them as if they are your people. They are God's people. All of you belong to the Lord. All of you. And then he says, but what I want you to do, I want you to be an example to the flock. What does he mean an example? Deacon Gardner would always say this phrase. I never forgot it. What I hear, I forget. But what I see, I remember. You see, an example of a godly life is what a pastor should be presenting to you. Does that mean that a pastor is perfect? Of course not. Listen, it takes as much of God's grace and the blood of Jesus to forgive me of my wrongs as it does anyone else. But it does mean, it does indicate that you should have a level of spiritual maturity to where when people are looking for an example of a godly husband, a godly father, a man that loves his children, a man that points him in the right direction, a man that prays, a man that studies the Bible, a man that tries with every ounce of his being to do what God's word says. And when he gets off track, he's humble enough to go down in prayer. Father, forgive me. What was I thinking? I'm so sorry. And godly living in time can push that to the back of the line. Yes, you should be an example. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're the fastest person on the track team. No. But it does mean you don't trip up because you can't tie your track shoes. And some of the stuff that's tripping up as we follow the analogy. Some local pastors and national pastors is they just can't tie their shoes. They're in leadership, but they just hadn't even learned to tie their shoes. So when it talks about being an example to the flock, God 
holds me accountable for the way I live. He holds all of you accountable, all of us. God holds me accountable for my lifestyle. He does. Because my lifestyle can positively or negatively influence someone in the right or wrong direction. God says you need to be an example. And listen, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, verse 4, appear to who? Well, who has he been talking about? He's been talking about the elders. He's been talking about taking oversight. He's been talking about the pastor of a church. Because when God calls the roll, he ain't going to come to the deacon about the church. He's not going to come to the choir member about the church. He's not going to come to the assistant, the secretary about, no. He's going to come to the one who I gave delegated authority to take oversight of my people. He's going to come to that person. And it says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, appear to the pastor, if you've done it the way God has commanded, you shall receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. You will be properly rewarded. Which also goes against pastoring for filthy lucre or pastoring for money. Your real reward can't be quantified in dollar signs. Your real reward will be given to you when you stand before the Lord and you've led people the way God wants you to lead them. Listen, I want to say this to you before we get to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to say this to you plainly. is that it is difficult in today's time to preach the truth. Difficult in, in, in this respect. Now, the, the word of God is not difficult, but difficult in, in this aspect. A lot of people don't want the truth. And you can be shouted down. You can even be, uh, what's the phrase? You can even be canceled for saying what the Bible says do. But we're not to let the culture, we're not to let lukewarm Christians we're not to let people who disagree with us stop us from lovingly presenting what the Bible says. And when you have done that and you have led in a way that God says you should lead, you will stand before him again. You will appear before him. And guess what you get? Your real reward. You will receive a crown of glory that will not fade away. It's a nod to the Greek games to where they would receive a wreath on their head. You may have seen these uh, uh, statues of these leaders in Rome and Greek leaders with the, the wreath that comes together in the front. They would put a wreath on their head. You have won. You have finished the race. You have been the victor. But God said the crown that I give you it's not like those crowns. Those crowns are going to dry up, become brittle. They're going to turn to dust one day. They're going to fade away. But the reward I give you, it will never fade away. Only if you've been obedient to verses 1, 2, and 3. So we need to know this. We need to grow in this area of understanding. Now, we look at the positive. I'd be remiss if we didn't look at this, the negative. Second Peter chapter 2. Verses 1, 2, and 3. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Beginning in verse 1, Peter asserts the fact. God lays down the fact. Let me tell y'all something. You've had false teachers, and you will continually have false teachers. The fact of false teachers has been established by the Bible. God said, in the past, you had people that would teach the wrong thing intentionally. In the present, you have people that would teach the wrong thing intentionally. So here's how this should inform us. When it comes to preaching and teaching, that's not time to go to sleep, people. That's not time to rest. That's not time to text and, you know, play on social media. 
you should be paying very close attention. Not that you're suspicious of the preacher, pastor who's teaching and preaching. No, no, no. But so that you can be made aware if he just made a plain old mistake. He said chapter two, he meant chapter one. Or if he's deliberately, consistently leading you away from what the text says. Because there were and there are false teachers and preachers among you. And they shall privily, privately, under the cover and cloak of what is good, they will bring in damnable heresies. They'll bring in teaching that is heretical, false, that is anti-biblical, that is not correct according to scripture, even to the point denying the Lord. And they will do this, but they have a reward as well. The same way the pastors will receive a crown of glory that fades not away if they're obedient. These false teachers and prophets, they have a reward as well. They will bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 2, and many, this is the part that gets me, not a few, but many shall follow their pernicious ways. Lord have mercy. Many people are going to fall in line behind this false teaching. How is that to be? Because if you have your Bible and you pray and you get your resources and you study and you check behind what is being preached and what the Bible says versus what is being preached to you and you see it's wrong, how can you have many that will follow them? Well, I want to say this, people. When you don't study the Bible, when you don't follow behind the preacher as he's preaching through the text, and I don't know, take a few notes here and there and use it in your own personal time to grow. If that process is not a part of your spiritual growth and development, you are low hanging fruit. You will be easily deceived. You can be swept away by entertainment, by showmanship, by the presentation, he sounds credible. He looks credible. Everybody around me is saying amen. It must be true. You are low-hanging fruit. I'm going to say this. There is a local church here. won't say the church's name or the pastor's name. But in my field, my career, um, I do networking and I study. Uh, um, I, I repair copiers. And I happened to be repairing a copier at a church. And the church was a notable church, big, huge church. And they were printing off a copy to test of the pastor's Bible study that was coming up. And I said, can I have a copy? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. I got home, looked at it that evening. And I was shocked. I was, I was like, and this is in no way to be demeaning to the church, the people, and or the pastor, but only to give a, 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 a truth, a fact. I was like, there's nothing in this that's coming from this book. Two pages front and back of this, 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 nothing based on scripture. Like a, a five-year-old could have got up there and read it and said these general statements that have nothing to do with the Bible. And on the back page toward the bottom, it was like a piece of a scripture about something. I was like, in my mind, I thought, how are people coming? To, how, are they, how are they digesting cotton candy and expecting to grow? How are they digesting whipped cream that looks solid but is really fluff that, how do they got thousands of people showing up? I have no idea. But verse 2 tells me that many people are going to follow their per pernicious ways. And that word means plastic. It's, it's a way of saying talking out both sides of their face. 
Say one thing one day, say another. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What that means is when people come to knowledge that this person is a fraud, what he's saying is untrue, many times they don't just leave that location. They wipe their hands of Christianity and anything spiritual altogether. And we've met those people who will say, man, it, it, it's just a joke. That preacher ain't talking about nothing. Man, I ain't about got tired of that old fake mess. Man, come on. They speak evil of the way of truth because they've been spurned and they've been burned and hurt and led, uh, uh, led astray by a particular preacher and or pastor. So many people, they wipe their hands of anything Christian. Hm, I ain't studying that, man. I tried that church junk. It don't work. Man, just a whole bunch of folk trying to get you to pad their pocket. I went to Kenneth Copeland Church and had me giving my money and talking about blessings going to come. And I ain't getting no blessings, but he got a brand new car. And when I needed help from the church, the preacher I'm giving money to didn't do nothing for me. I ain't got time for that, man. It makes people's view of Christianity, of the Bible, of God, of spirituality, it makes it decline. And it said, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And it says, verse 3, and through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. Keep in mind, when you compare 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, the A portion, to what 1 Peter chapter 5 says, when it says, feed the flock of God, Shepherd them, lead them, protect them, provide for them. They are to be the recipients of the meal. The membership is not to be the meal. Now we see the flip side of that. These false teachers with heretical doctrine, guess what? They're going to make merchandise of you. They're going to take you upside down and shake you for every penny that you've got. You will not receive a spiritual meal. You will be the meal to them. You're going to put them in a new car, a new house. You're going to buy Creflo Dollar, a brand new jet, and you're going to be happy to do it, saying it's all in the name of Jesus. Well, you know, I got to get a new jet, you know, because uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland said, I have to get a new jet because you know how much ministry I can do? And Tyler Perry sold it to me at a price that it would have been laughable not to buy it. So the people of God, I just claim in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 A, B, C, one, two, three. They're going to make merchandise of you. They're going to, with their feigned words, make merchandise of you. You're going to be their personal piggy bank. You're going to be the meal that they devour. Devour, excuse me. And at the end of verse 3, there is hope. Their judgment. Now it does not linger. Their damnation. It does not slumber. Here's what Peter is saying in 2 Peter chapter 3, the B portion of that verse. Chapter 2, verse 3, the B portion of that verse. Don't fool yourself. You can get by, but you won't get away. To every person that's faking being a preacher, to every person whose heart is not really in it for serving and loving and worshiping and honoring God, but your motive is to get to a small church and when a bigger church come open, get to a bigger church because they pay you more money. And then when the big church in Memphis come open, the Texas come open, you go there because they pay you more money. And that's your only goal, just to climb the ladder of materialism and success in that way. If that's your goal and you'll say anything, you'll do anything to get more people to say amen and get more money coming in, but you'll be be gone as soon as the church around the corner. When Second Baptist come open, oh, your name is in the hat. Yeah, I got to go to Second Baptist. They got a big church. Look at that big old building they got. Surely they'll pay me enough money. I can be full time over there. And that's your goal. Your damnation is on the way. Your judgment is around the corner. If you think you can mistreat God's people, abuse them, make merchandise to them, teach and preach heretical doctrine, be someone who is insincere in the way you live. Do not set God's example, act like a Lord over God's heritage and mistreat them. You think God going to let that happen? 
I'll close by saying this. How many parents would allow the daycare center to mistreat your child? And when you find out about it, how long would it take you to respond? How quickly would you react? We are sinful, but we have a basic love to protect and care for our children. And even as sinful and flawed as we are, when you find out they did, they did what to my child? Oh no, I'm taking off work for this. We are finna talk about this. How do you think God will respond when he sees these false, insincere, materialistic, arrogant, Men standing behind that sacred desk thinking they got everybody fooled, but they don't because God sees it all. And you think you're going to empty the account of some well-intentioned senior citizen. You think you're going to lie to the young person who is trying to learn God's word and you give them some word salad that don't make no sense and got nothing to do with the Bible. You think God going to let you slide? Mm -mm. It don't happen that way. I'm going to close right here to let us know we need to grow. Number one, people, pay attention when the word is being taught. Pay attention. Listen attentively. Listen attentively so you can learn, but also listen attentively so you can see. Okay, he said chapter two, but he meant verse two. It's just, he just made a mistake. Or you can see. Well, wait a minute now, this ain't talking about that. Even the notes in my study Bible are telling me something way different than what you, let me check this out when I get home. Let me take some notes here. So guess what? When you incorporate that into the way that you listen and worship and learn and grow, it helps defend you from being made merchandise of, from being the meal for some preacher to get him a new car and a new suit. Mm -mm. You know what is from the heart reaches the heart. You may not know about this book or this chapter or this verse or this passage, but something on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit says, I need to look into that myself. Something just don't quite line up with that. Let me check that out myself. Because people, if you don't do that, you position yourself to be taken advantage of. If you're not looking at these verses with me right now, you don't know if I'm making this up or just throwing some stuff out there. So please make sure, make sure, invest in your own spiritual defense, spiritual protection. Follow along with the preacher. Listen, it's not wrong to follow behind him. Help him. When he's saying something true, say amen. Give vent to the truth. But when you come across some of these so-called preachers that's leading these churches, TV, national, local, or not, and they talking a whole bunch of junk and stuff, my advice to you is to pray. Get your hat and your coat if you don't change and get out of there. And I'm not saying come to New Hebron, but find somewhere where you can see the Bible is being preached, the Bible is being taught. I can follow along with this preacher because people, we don't have time for entertainment no more. All this walking the pews and throwing your handkerchief in the air and doing the splits and taking my jacket off and leaning backwards and spitting and slobbering on the mic. We ain't got time for that mess no more. Listen, people, we need the word. Uh, listen, nothing wrong with a person who just in his character, the way God made him, he's animated. Some people, God just gave that to him. But if you hang your hat on exterior junk and stuff to make you feel good, to give you a good churchy feeling, and there's no Bible being preached. You're eating cotton candy and wondering why you're still hungry. No, 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 no. You're eating cotton candy and wondering why you're still hungry. Talk back to me if you can. Study God's word, stay with God's word, follow God's word, and this can be a defense to protect you from being taken advantage of. It really can. Lord knows, as I begin to grow, I don't want to say his name. I don't want to say nothing negative about him in this way, but I'm only giving a testimony, my personal growth. Lord knows, I sat and listened to this particular preacher in the pulpit, and I sat there Sunday after Sunday, starving, watching what he said. That ain't, that's not... No, that don't mean that. 
No, no, no. That, that. Watching. I still got programs in my bedroom right now on my bookshelf from the Lord had to discipline me to not make funny faces in the pulpit because that's influencing people. And I don't want to make it seem like I'm openly against this preacher. But I just would see it and be like, what? Like, that? that's, no. That. So, uh-uh, don't do that, Rodney. And I would just take my own little note, take a note, study verse 16, study verse 2, study chapter 8, study the book, study the, uh, like, God used my situation to help me develop better study habits so that I wouldn't be what I was looking at. I'm not saying I'm the world's best preacher. Lord, no, no, please. I'm, this is not self-aggrandizing. Uh, this is not self-serving. I'm only giving a testimony that when I began to look in the book and listen to what was said from the book, I could say, no, that's not from this book. Oh, he making that up. That, that word don't mean that. No, it don't. That, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find the exact word, what it means. And when I would find it, I would be like, well, why would he say that if it wasn't true? Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday after Wednesday. Why would he? Oh, 2 Peter 2. There were false prophets. You got false teachers now. Oh, okay. And then when such and such church came open, he'll make a big old statement. I love y'all so much. I, I got to take a sabbatical. Take a sabbatical? What are you I got to pray, boy. My spirit is just low. And what he was doing was going to preach around the corner. Little Rock ain't big. You're going to preach over there because the church open and the, the big church and they can pay you more money than what this church can give you. But you give us this big old statement about how much you love us and I'm going to be here for 50 years till the Lord carry me out of here. But really, just going around the corner. Just lying. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for deliverance. So let me encourage you. Study the word. We need to grow. So I'll cut it off right there. It's 11.32. I have a 12 noon service that I have to be at in North Florida Rock. Christian Mission Church, Founders Day. I'm going to head over there. I'm going to preach God's word with God's help. Uh, I ask for y'all to continue to keep me in your prayers. For those of you who have to get out today, be careful in this heat. Lord, it's hot out there. Be careful in this heat. And let me close after those announcements by telling you this. Jesus lived. He died. He shed his blood for all of our sins past, present, and future. He did that for us. And when you read the scriptural account of his life and his death and his resurrection, and you recognize he died for me, and it causes you to repent of the way that you're living, that's called salvation. I want you to truly know that Jesus shed his blood for all of our sins, gave his life that when we die, we won't have to taste the sting of death, but we can say goodbye world and hello Jesus. That we can live a life while we are alive that is pleasing to his sight. He gives us the grace when we make mistakes, the grace to get out of it. He loves us enough to where he certainly wants to see the best for us. Give yourself to him. He hung on the cross from the sixth to the ninth hour. He gave up the ghost. He died. But early that Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. Because he died for me, I'm going to live for him. God bless you. God keep you. It's my prayer.